Welcome to the Resilient Training Lab Podcast. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Resilient Training Lab Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan, here with Coach Paul. And today we're joined with our friend, Dustin. So what's going on, Dustin? What's going on, Ryan? What's going on, Paul? Glad to be here. Thanks for uh, having me on. We're thrilled. Thanks for coming on. Resilient Training Lab operates out of a gym in North Haven called Revolution Fitness Clubs. And so when we first got to Revolution Fitness Clubs, Dustin was there. Uh, He was involved with the gym opening. And that's how we formed our relationship. And, you know, we chit chat training and bounce ideas back and forth. And we even had a fun little trainer book club a little over a year ago. Remember those days? Yeah, that was about a year ago, up up until I think August or so is when things kind of started. I started kind of weeding my way out a little bit or or weeding my way out, I should say, as in preparation for my son. But yeah, those are good times. Yeah, Dustin used to assign me homework and now Paul does. So it's great. (laughs) Fun fact, Dustin's actually probably the one of the main reasons resilient is a thing. (laughs) During the early days, you know, reached out to me and let me know about Revolution and kind of got that ball rolling. So got props to Dustin. <laughs> yeah, I made the facilitated the introductions that were necessary. Definitely networked pretty hard in the, the fitness field in the North Haven area. Well, I saw this big dude with funky shorts deadlifting <laughs> 650 pounds. And I was like, I got to introduce myself to this guy. And Ryan, I think we met after maybe one of the little seminars that I put on and we just kind of hit it off right away and we knew a lot of the same people and yeah, you know, we had a lot of similar philosophies about training. So started chit chatting pretty quick. Yeah. If any of you have never been in revolution fitness clubs, I don't think this was known at the time where it was being opened, but there's a basement underneath it. And so when you get somebody Paul sized deadlifting the kind of weights that Paul is, when there's no solid floor underneath you, it's freaking loud. So everybody knew <laughs> when uh, Paul is in their training. And if you've ever been down there, have either of you guys ever been in the basement when somebody was yeah, lifting? It's like a Never war been zone. in the basement, but Jay and I went down there one day when Paul was training. It was absurd. It was <laughs> hand, hand grenades going off every freaking every other second. So you kind of hinted at it earlier, Dustin, or you, you said it, but we, I didn't highlight it. So uh, you're a new father. I actually haven't talked to you since uh, your your son Jack was born. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Did you enjoy your first Father's Day? Uh, yeah, actually, we, uh, we had some family over the house, you know, social distance and everything. And, uh, you know, had a little barbecue and it was like the first time kind of seeing everybody together in quite a while. So it was uh, it was nice. And I, uh, my son is a riot. So, you know, it was a good it was a good time had by all. Awesome, man. I'm glad to hear it. So over the last year, I mean, you've had a, a hell of a year, uh, and I was hoping today we could talk a little bit about just your your career path, because I, I think you started out working in person with people and have kind of transitioned yeah. that into a more remote client base. And there's just been a lot of changes over the last year with becoming a father. And so I'm just really interested to hear how something that significant has maybe changed your your views on training or maybe some of the priorities that you have going on. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, I I did start training people in person and I did that for about 13 years and I went through a variety of roles at that train at that facility. It was a a gym local to uh, where I live here and, you know, really enjoyed my time there. But like, I always want, my dad is a kind of a serial entrepreneur and he worked from home for a couple of years when I was a kid. And I just remember him always being around and I've always liked that idea. And I'm a little bit of a, I like my alone time. You know what I mean? I, I like the social interaction and, and seeing my buddies in the gym and stuff. And I like that that aspect of being in the gym, right? The community part of it. But I've always wanted to do my own thing out of on my own terms, out of my own house. And uh, I started putting wheels in motion for that about three years ago now, or yeah, about three years ago now. And then officially left that gym that I was at a little over two and a half years ago and have been on my own running an online training business since then with that small stint at Revolution Fitness Clubs, just kind of helping Jay get the ball rolling there. Yeah, you did a great job. I mean, the ball's rolling pretty good. If you had to describe your overall, I don't want to say clientele because, you know, you're work, I'm sure you're working with a wide variety of people, but uh, do you consider yourself to be 
focused on a specific area of training or like a type of programming? Yeah, for sure. So even though I work in an online setting, a lot of people might associate that with more advanced clientele or people with very specific goals. A lot of my clients are actually along the general population line, people who are just looking to get more fit. You know, I do have clients with specific goals and I have some people that uh, have competed in, in various sports, but for the most part, it's people who are kind of in my bracket now. They're 35 and up. They have families, they have jobs or they're professionals and they want to fit fitness into their life. And they hired me to kind of help them do that. So yeah, I, I work with mostly Gen Pop through and through. I don't know that we've had too many conversations about this, Paul, but you know, I think a lot of our podcast episodes have really focused on people who want to be in the gym more and more and more. You know, their program is almost never enough. They have five, six days a week of training, a couple hours. And I don't think we've really talked about how that's almost the easiest scenario to program for somebody, you know, somebody who's willing to do the work, willing to do anything, and you have no restrictions. They're a blank slate. Yeah. When when you have a lot of time with people, you can try different things and you have more time to push volume and train different aspects of fitness. But one of the biggest barriers to fitness, and there's actually been a lot of research on this, is is time. And we hear it all the time. There's I don't have the time to do that. Or, you know, there's not enough hours in the day. I'm busy with X or Y. I have all these other hobbies. And when there's not a lot of time, we have to be very efficient with what we do. And we have to be sure that we're getting the most return on our investment and that the things we're asking our client to do are going to push adaptation and get them closer to their goals and closer to where they want to be and that we're not wasting any of their time. And I think Dustin has kind of taken this on as almost his niche. And I think maybe fatherhood forced that hand a little bit, Uh, (laughs) but he's definitely an expert in that area of making the most out of your time in the gym. Is that something that you focus a lot on Dustin with, like you said, gen pop people who are, you know, 35 plus and the gym isn't necessarily the number one priority in their life? Yeah, because I I think everybody at some point is going to become that person where time is your most valuable asset. I mean, it is for everybody, but you know, when you're younger, you're in train an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours plus per day, you don't even think about it. But then priorities shift in life and that window of time starts to shrink. And so like Paul alluded to, you need to maximize that investment. And for me, I'm, I'm always thinking about eliminating barriers and eliminating friction to get that done. So when talking about training efficiency, I'm looking at the not just the session as a whole, but the individual's lifestyle as a whole and finding, finding the gaps that we might need to fill for that individual that might be outside of the gym or maybe even outside of what they originally came to me for. You know, I think you guys know that sometimes people come to you and they want one thing or they think they need one thing, but we're telling them they need this, this, and this first. But this, this, and this really is just starts off as one thing that I want you to be successful with. And then we can move on to the next thing and kind of move forward in a stepwise fashion like that. So I hope that answers that question. But yeah, it's something that I'm always thinking about, not just for my clients, but for myself too. So we see that a lot. People coming in with certain goals and thinking they need a certain thing. And then, you know, after talking to them, you realize that they might have more return spending their efforts elsewhere. And sometimes that's a difficult conversation to have, you know, where people come in with a certain mindset and you have to try and steer them a different way. Do you have any kind of strategies you use and use there? Because I know just telling them right off the bat, like, hey, I know you want to do this, but let's do this. doesn't doesn't really work. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I think that, and I've made that mistake too, of, you know, shooting people, right. And it's like telling them what they should do as opposed to, uh, almost kind of putting the power in their hands. So what I like to do is, you know, find out what the person wants. And that's often not in the first conversation. That's something that takes, I think, several conversations to reach, you know, to where they're actually comfortable with not just, you know, because everybody wants the six pack or wants the, you know, the bigger squat, but it's like, it's the old Simon Sinek thing of why do you want that thing? And it's layers deep. 
So once we get to that point, I like to make it like we're making a compromise. Like let's meet in the middle. You know what I mean? Like I have what I think you, what I think you need at this point in time. You have what you think you want. Let's meet in the middle. And uh, I think when you give somebody the choice, you're giving that person power. And I, and I think they can start to take ownership over what they're doing as opposed to if you prescribe whatever, uh, any sort of exercise modality or nutrition piece to them and, and they're not adhering to it and they're not able to follow through. They feel like they're failing the plan and they never, they never end up developing that ownership of why they're actually going through and doing this. So to answer your question, I like to meet people in the middle. Let's compromise. I want you to trust me that I have your best interest in mind. And then usually from there, you know, this might take a few months. I Sometimes it takes a couple of years before the, you know, I, I think the individual just kind of realizes like, okay, uh, I, my hands are off. You take the wheel now and tell me what to do. But I, that process takes time as a coach, I think. So in the beginning, when you're working with somebody, there is that, like, there's that give and take. And I think you brought this up in a bunch of different ways uh, where, you know, they might want to be doing something specific, but you know, in reality, when we really get to the why of what their goal is and why they want to be there, you might know that instead of shooting somebody, hey, you need to be doing this or you should be doing this. It's almost like we like we have the leash on and we just slowly start to bring them over to where they'll get more out of their time investment or their energy investment in the gym. And so are there common I don't want to say pitfalls, but are there common traps where people are losing a lot of efficiency that you see in, in the gen pop population? I, I think there's several. Okay. And uh, one point that I made, I made this, I think in an Instagram post yesterday was looking at warmups and in our, in our industry, especially where we are, it's kind of, we're, we're a little bit of the niche side of the fitness industry, right? Like we hang around other good coaches and we consider ourselves to be maybe smarter than your average bear. And so within that crowd, sometimes we tend to overprescribe things in an effort to appear smart, right? Or to appear like we know what we're talking about. And the problem with that is that sometimes somebody who may not need that information right then and there sees that and they believe that that's what they need. And if they don't do that, they are missing out on something. And, and the reason why this is important, uh, kind of like going back full circle here, is, is talking about this. Most people have a very limited window of time. And when I'm trying to think about eliminating friction or eliminating barriers to training, I, I know for me, like if I see a particular program with an extensive warm up, and I know that's going to take me well over an hour to complete, like, I, quite frankly, like there are those, just those days where you're like, I don't even want to do this, you know, and I've had clients tell me that because I've been that guy in the past where I over prescribed certain things, thinking that, okay, this is what this client wants to see. And then compliance compliance would drop down because they're like, I just don't have that much time to dedicate to training. So I, I think it's a matter of finding the most effective way to get that person prepared to train. And to, if we're talking about warm up still, the next thing is figuring out how many days a week do you actually need to train and what needs to go into those particular training days. You know, so we talk about things like exercise selection, making sure that we're selecting the exercises that are going to get us the biggest bang for our buck, provide the necessary stimulus that you need on that particular day to get you from point A to point B. Um, and at the same time, still make that training session enjoyable, something that you like to do and that you're willing to actually give enough effort to start to see progress. And then if we're talking about how many days per week, you know, I think like you guys said, like sometimes you do have those clients who are like, yeah, I have five, six days a week. Give me whatever you, you know, whatever you can throw the kitchen sink at me. I'll do it. But I'm oftentimes trying to talk people off the ledge a little bit because it's like, I know you think you can do this right now, but I've seen this so many times that if I can get convince you to, let's say, train three days per week and you're consistent with those three days per week and you're successful for many, many, many weeks in a row and then lo and behold, before you know it, that person's actually made progress and they stuck to a plan the longest that they've ever stuck to a plan. And, you know, you don't want to go back and tell that person like, see, but there is a little bit of that, you know, you're finally starting to gain that person's trust because they're like, oh yeah, I, I did commit to the last 12 weeks, 13 weeks, 14 weeks of three days a week training. And I haven't missed a training day. And they're able to now take that next step, whatever. And it might not be adding training, but it could be 
they're willing to make additional strides with their nutrition, or they're looking now at ways of incorporating more activity outside of their training. And now it really becomes a lifestyle, you know, in, in that way. I think it's really awesome that you answered that from the perspective of an online coach and not necessarily the client, right? So you said that a lot of times coaches are over prescribing where there is an exercise or a preparation, you know, air quotes, preparation movement for any anything of importance that they're going to be doing in the gym. And a lot of times those are just really big time sinks. And then getting into working with your online clients and how you are focusing on you know, ensuring their successes and building up their competencies and their consistency before adding more into the pot. I think a lot of times we, we also see clients who aren't like, this is going to kind of tie into like working hard in the gym, right? But like, they think they're working hard, whatever, hitting an RPE of six or seven or eight, and, and they're nowhere close. They don't know what working hard actually is. And so a lot of times these clients who are training five, six days a week, they're they're moving five or six days a week, but what what is the actual quality of their training? How how high is their effort, and what are some of those variables outside of the gym looking like? How much control do they have over those? I think those are all really great points that you brought up. Thanks, man. And uh, you know, I think effort is a learned trait as well. This is something I try to write about. I I almost kind of talk out of two sides of my mouth in this way, whereas I'm I'm almost overly gentle in the way I want people to just get started and get moving. And that's for your, your person who's, you know, off the couch kind of deal. And then I want them to eventually get to the point where they are confident and comfortable and have, like you said, the competency to actually push themselves to what we know a training session should look like, or what we know a hard set should look like. I think that just takes time. And if there's one thing I try to stress and anything I I put out on social media is the fact that it takes time and you're not going to necessarily achieve all of your wildest dreams in eight weeks. Uh, It might take eight years, you know, and and really it's decades long because we we do want to do this stuff for the rest of our lives in some form or fashion. That's a, that's a great point that training hard is, you know, a learned quality. And, you know, I think that's kind of what starts to separate people as they become more and advanced lifters is, you know, when someone's new, they just don't have that ability to like exert all their force maximally all at once. And as they become more trained and they get better at doing that, they're able to, you know, progress at a greater rate and then put more into their workouts and get more out of them. And then they start to see like, Hey, you know, three or four training, hard training sessions a week is all I can really handle if I'm actually getting after it in the gym. and What I've really noticed, and I I think I've heard you talk about this before, is as people start to like learn how to give effort in a workout and know how intense their workout should be, things outside of the gym start to kind of fall in place because of that. Would you say that's something that you see? Yeah, absolutely. Because it starts to matter. (laughs) You know, when, when you know, when your training starts to become that important to you, you know that, okay, if I go into that session with a poor night's sleep or not enough quality food the day before, or, you know, I'm not handling the different stressors that are going on in my life, whether it's finances or relationships or whatever, like you start to pinpoint these things and start to connect some dots. And you're like, oh, if I actually take care of these things, my training goes better. I make faster progress. I feel better when I'm training. I feel better on when I'm not training. Like, and I, yeah, it's something that I'm, I think I'm always trying to work on with, with folks is just getting them to understand that importance, right? There's, if your average person trains, even if they train five hours a week, which is probably for a, your average person, a decent amount, that's still 163 hours left to either royally screw things up or make everything better. Yeah. And those things that you just mentioned, sleep, nutrition, recovery, stress management, they they play a huge role in our progress inside the gym. And I think a lot of times in that online arena, those those things are kind of lost in the coaching relationship where where it almost turns into the, you know, getting a program and maybe a little bit of feedback from the program and that's it. So how do you go about kind of implementing some of those strategies and working with your online clients with some of those kind of lifestyle habits that might be a little more like 
you can't program them. You can't just write it on a piece of paper and right. say, do this. <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, I, I use a, a very typical weekly or biweekly check-in with my online clients. And I, I really leave it in there. I put the ball in their court. And the reason for that is, is I can't beg you to change, you know, and I've, cause I've gone that route where I, you know, was almost, I would harp on clients and I would be like over the top with them and, you know, often would get more pushback. Right. So I kind of leave the ball in their court and allow them to see those changes for themselves. And some of the subjective questions that I ask them are kind of these reflection based questions where they can look back on their week, see what they have done correctly, what went well, what didn't go well, what would they like to work on next? And it becomes an exercise that for some people, they may view it as redundant week in, week out. It's kind of the same. And then something tends to click where like, yeah, one week something changed and they're like, you know, they write me a full paragraph and I'm like, okay, now we're starting to get somewhere. And then they, you know, we, we have like a little conversation about it and they correct course and then they're good for another little while. I, I think as a coach, I don't necessarily want to be a handholder and I don't necessarily want you to depend on me as much as I want you to use me as a guide and know that, hey, I'm here for you if you need me. I'm going to give you all the tools that you need, but we're going to do it in a fashion that is sustainable, you know, because I, I, I've been that guy who's thrown the kitchen sink at people. Uh, and I probably still do it to some degree. Like, I think it's just a old habit. I think a lot of us, we have like, we have a lot of information in here, right? And it's, it's, there's a lot going on. We want to help people as much as we can. And it's just easy to overwhelm. So I've been trying to pull back actually in a lot of ways, give less and allow people to do more with that, if that makes sense. It's really tempting to throw the kitchen sink at people. I think that they, it's almost expected, right? We think of our favorite example of the over cure personal trainer or coach where somebody's doing an exercise and the personal trainer literally will not stop just shouting things at them. And it just looks like a clown fiesta. It's, you know, that doesn't work, even though people might perceive a trainer as maybe they, they should be doing that again, quotes on should, but how it's, it's tough to manage that balance of providing enough information to either help the person or keep them interested or sort of demonstrate value, but not overload them on the other end where now they just feel overwhelmed and they don't know what they should be focusing on. And they're almost distracted by all the bright colors and shiny lights. Yeah, I, I would rather you be successful and and consistent than feel like you're getting this like magic elixir of, of a training program, you know, and, and it's not to say all my programming is boring or super basic. I mean, a lot of it is, but people tend to get better results and they tend to stick with it longer, especially with the population that I that I work with. You know? I think sometimes as coaches, we just get so excited about new information and want to share it with everybody and put all this things that we find cool and interesting. But, you know, most people just don't care. <laughs> uh, they don't, they, they just want the results. They don't, they don't want to hear about the latest research paper that you read or, or the latest course you went to. And, you know, sometimes being able to realize that and be able to give out the proper information goes just as far into that efficient training as, creating actual efficient training programs. Uh, again, we're not, we're trying to be, we're not trying to waste, you know, this whole podcast is about being efficient with your clients and not wasting their time. And that comes down to information as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think information overload is a huge problem, not just for our clients, but you know, for us as coaches as well, because I'll, I have no problem admitting, like I am that guy. Like I am a voracious reader and I love you know, finding out that like that new little thing, not that I think it's a, you know, that weird trick that's going to help me, but it's just for people like us, like it's just what we do. It's our hobby as much as it is our vocation. So it's hard not to, you know, it's hard to like hold back that passion sometimes in, in some ways. But if there's something that I'm always trying to do, it's just like pare things down, simplify. Um, and it just comes through experience, I think, and reflection on that. Yeah, there's a balance between seeking out new information versus actually putting it into practice. If you're constantly reading, you never end up helping a single person if you're, you know, head down in a book all the time. And so it's it's interesting for me to see how my priorities in that realm have shifted throughout, you know, the I guess five or six years that I've been 
actively coaching. I definitely think in the beginning, I focused way too much on, on reading and not the, the soft skills of interacting with people that really are the, the hard skills in our field. So beyond what we were talking about with, you know, making the likelihood of our training happening, right? It's like, if we're, if we're constantly missing sleep, if we don't have a plan, we're not going to get to the gym as much. I know, I think, was it you, Dustin? Maybe we had talked about one time in one of the trainer book clubs, how scheduling sessions at the beginning of the week was something that resulted in a significantly increased likelihood of the, of the training actually happening. Do you remember that or no? Possibly. You know, I've heard Dr. Pat Davidson discuss that quite a bit um, on various podcasts. So maybe I got that from him, but I think it's the idea of, you know, setting the tone, right? Right in the beginning of the week so that not only are they successful in the beginning of the week, but they also, if once training has become important to them and once they take ownership of, over this process, the weekend is no longer this, for lack of a better term, shit show. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard Pat talk about that. That's why in mass he puts the most miserable training day on day on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the thirty thirty is brutal, and it, as, if anybody has ever done that to the highest level that you possibly can, like you do not want to go in there after two nights of poor sleep, excess drinking, you know, crappy food. Uh, you want to be raring to go. I feel like. I remember again another conversation where maybe it was like the strength coach that the strength coach at the the New York Giants who you know would start putting the hardest training days on on Wednesday, but he got that from working at a at the university level maybe right before that where he, you can plan to push your college football players hard on Monday, but you know they're I don't think they all appreciate the the necessary steps to perform on a Monday morning, right? <laughs> when it means the sacrifice of your weekend. So yeah, uh, that's definitely a conversation I've had with clients a couple of times, actually this week coming back is that the the beginning of the week, I think Matt Duvall noticed that uh, the heaviest squats and deadlifts come on day one and two for us. So yep. it's important to pay attention to. <laughs> it's definitely so, done on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're on the talk of efficiency at the end of the day, what Dustin do you consider the the lowest hanging fruit within the strength training world? What are what are your non negotiables for these people who have just signed up to Dustin Labelle remote coaching, and what are they getting? Yeah, generally, I, I mean, after we have a conversation and we kind of see where you're starting from, and you know, I have an idea of what you like to do and what you need. You know, I want you to strength train three days a week. You know, I think that's pretty uh, appropriate. You know, we can argue for two days, but I, I think three days really sets the tone for being consistent. It fits most people's schedule. They can generally like finagle those days if they need to. You know, if, if life gets in the way and you, you miss your Wednesday session, you can just do it on Thursday. No harm, no foul. And that's kind of my starting point. You know, I try to keep those sessions within that 45 minute or so window. Give or take, you know, with someone on the newer side of things, it might take a little bit less just because they're not working up to that heavy of a, of a load, you know, with any one exercise. So there's fewer warm ups, you know, probably less total rest between sets, that kind of thing, just because they're not able to exert all that much force. Um, and then on off days, like if I can just convince people to start with walking on their off days, and it's not that I'm, I'm not anti high intensity training, I'm not anti intervals by any means. But it's, it's understand, like, again, going back to this thing is people think they want one thing or they've, they've heard they want one thing. And it's like, I just need you to show me, show me first that you can be successful with this almost kind of like bare minimum approach. And then once they are, lo and behold, like usually by the end of the first month or two, people are starting to be in, getting a good groove. They're almost like, yeah, like, I actually feel good. Their subjective questionnaires are starting to become like a little more uh, along the lines of like, how, how well they're sleeping, they're starting starting to crave less foods just because they're not always just running on that cortisol drip of just constantly digging that hole. And from there, I like to see what people actually want to do. You know, some people are set for life right there, right? Three days a week strength training, walk on off days or preferably every day. Uh, you could do that for the rest of your life and be pretty good. But then oftentimes people get to that point where like, okay, I want to I want to run a local 5k and then we can start to weave that kind of stuff in or I want to hike a 14 or I had a client this past weekend hike her first 14 or and you know she texted me the day before and she was super nervous and you know wasn't sure what to do nutrition wise wasn't sure how to like tackle it in terms of pacing 
I mean, she ended up crushing it. I mean, it was I think five hours and 45 minutes or so, and it seems pretty miserable. But she had a great time, loved it. I mean, we weren't necessarily preparing for that per se, you know, but she was, she had been, you know, getting ready for a sprint try that ended up being canceled due to the uh, you know, pandemic that we're currently finding ourselves in. And so, you know, for her, we're kind of always finding ways to weave in it out of different activities that she likes and enjoys. And then we always kind of go back to that baseline when things have kind of reached that plateau. So to answer your question, yes, uh, I want people to strength train three days a week and we're just, we're squatting in some fashion, we're hinging in some fashion, we're upper body pressing, upper body pulling, maybe some single leg, maybe some type of core, I'm using quotation marks, core activity, and then other other stuff, whatever, you know, if they want more arm work, if they want more hip thrust for their glutes, whatever the thing is, like, I'm, I'm not opposed to giving people what they want, um, as long as they can check off the big boxes for me. So going back to what you started with, because I think you hit on a ton of great points and hopefully I can remember them all and we can slowly start to pick them apart. When you first get somebody and you mentioned, you know, 45 minutes, three times a week, is there ever a point where you sit down with somebody and have a conversation about, hey, you know, I, I think they might have the time to up that, you know, maybe we talk about increasing it to a fourth day or we go for a little, little bit longer of a session. Uh, is that a conversation that you ever have with your clients at? like without them approaching you? Yeah. So certain people have, do have more specific goals. Like they do care about maximal strength or they do have very specific conditioning goals, in which case it's kind of this delicate dance between doing the optimal, optimal amount of work that they need to adapt and progress. And then to also, you know, be able to recover from. So it's uh, often a conversation based upon what is your what does your schedule actually look like? What can you actually do? I think is a big question. And then, you know, especially with these weekly check-ins or bi-weekly check-ins that I'm doing with people, you know, I ask them like, let's go back and look at some of these answers. You know what I mean? Like you want to train more, but you haven't been sleeping as well the last couple of weeks or, you know, nutrition's been off a little bit. Like oftentimes I'm trying to commit, like, what do you, like the conversation ends up being like, what do you say we we get back to doing some of these things first. Show me you can do it. Let's get into some good patterns. Let's take a look at some more objective measurements as well. So I do track, you know, people's resting heart rates and things like blood pressure more for the, the sake of them being able to like see that, oh, when I sleep better and I go for walks, my resting heart rate and blood pressure are lower. Why don't, why don't you know? So we look at these things, both subjective and objective measurements, and then we can actually see like, okay, or take a look at, okay, like, where can we fit more in if that's even possible? You know, but that's a process that we might have to come full circle and it might take several weeks or months before we even add anything. And oftentimes people will find like almost kind of eat their own words in a way where they're like, I don't want to do that anymore. Like, let's stay with what we're doing because I actually do feel good. I'm making progress. You were right. <laughs> Paul, I'm, I'm not necessarily familiar with your full remote client profile, but do you have some gen pop clients in there? Yeah, I have a few, especially kind of offering remote services to people that we used to coach in person that, you know, had to move for whatever reason. And that's, that's a huge part of it is, is being able to look at their whole life and where we can make the most improvement and get the, like we were talking about the most return on our investment Whereas I also train a lot of competitive powerlifters and competitive strongmen. And when I'm with talking with them, the focus is like solely on training because they have, you know, outside motivators to help them with their sleep and their diet. And usually all that stuff is on point and they're looking for that, you know, just a little bit of edge uh, programming wise because they're already competing at a high level and have been training for a long time. And that's definitely a huge difference between, you know, your gen pop or just a newer client and a competitive powerlifter. But an interesting thing that I found is, you know, as you work with those gen pop clients a little longer or those new clients and you do those things Dustin's talking about, set up a, a reasonable schedule and have them be successful over and over and over again and have them be consistent for three, four, six months, even a year long where they're making progress that whole time and we're working on those lifestyle factors. 
they almost become that competitive powerlifter type client, not in the fact that they're competing in powerlifting, but in the fact they're so adherent to their program and they've been successful for so long that it becomes almost second nature and mindless. And then we can really dive deeper into programming and kind of play around with that and create some variety there or create, you know, some lofty goals for them. I think Dustin's program train for life is kind of that explains it, right? We're just trying to get these people ready for anything they want to take on. If they, if they want to go, run a 5k, they can do it. If they want to go run an obstacle course, they can do it. And we don't have to change our training because we've been, we've been training this whole time and they're ready for whatever they want to take on. Yeah. I think this is the point you guys make all the time in your posts is like always maintaining this baseline of fitness, right? So that you can take on more if required or if you want. I, I think the, uh, what was it today? It was like, you know, if, people often get injured because they take on too much too soon. And it's not uh, necessarily their, I forgot what the exact post was about, but it's not like some exercise is going to cure all of that. It's the program in its totality, their lifestyle in its totality, and making sure that all those kind of pieces of the puzzle are fitting together. Dude, you're on top of that. I think I posted that like an hour. (laughs) (laughs) It was well before this podcast. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Something that I think you brought up after the three days a week was increasing their need, getting their steps up. And I know that's something that's huge to Paul or all of us, but um, I know Paul talks about it a lot in his posts and with his guys who are very, very strong. Do you have strategies that you offer to clients who might struggle to go for walks? They might say, I'm in meetings all day sitting down, or they might not live in a neighborhood where that's the most reasonable goal for them yeah yeah i i find what is the least amount they can do to get started right for some people so yeah uh eventually i want everybody to be walking ten thousand steps a day right it's the number that we all throw around and but i know that's not feasible for everybody so i want to see where are you currently you know and if you're not even tracking steps or if that's something that you're not even interested like we're not gonna necessarily have that conversation right now uh we're gonna start with hey can you go for you know, I, I think you know we've heard the the ten minute walks, but can you go for a ten minute walk in the morning, or can you go for a ten minute walk in the evening? Can you walk laps in your house? Like it can be something as simple as that. I'll use this example. So my own father has recently taken uh, a liking to to walking. I mean, this is this is a man he's lost, I think, going on like sixty or seventy pounds now. He's sixty seven or going to be sixty seven years old in a couple of days here, and has made a complete lifestyle transformation. Like you know, at 66 and change. Uh, and he walks laps around the house. Like he's not quite comfortable with going outside yet. Although I think him and my mother do maybe around the neighborhood, but on his own in order to get his, cause he shoots for 10,000 steps in order to get his 10,000 walks around the house. And uh, it's been working for him and for him built the confidence to eventually be able to take on more. So when talking to my clients, it's finding what's the least amount you can do. It might not even be a daily goal for some people getting into the gym three days a week is all that they can handle, right? And so I'm looking at what's the least amount we can do on your off days. You know, I eventually I want people to be active every single day. We know that, but that might that might be a several month or, you know, year process sometimes. So, you know, I don't have any tricks up my sleeve per se. Like I, it's not necessarily, you know, hey, walk walk around the office. Yeah, get up and move if you can, but I I think sometimes people are hesitant to do some of those things because they go from the person who never did that stuff to now being the person who does that stuff. And people start to look at you differently, right? Like people in your life, when you start to make big changes or even small changes, people are like, what's going on with, you know, Bill? Like, <laughs> what, what are you doing, Bill? You're starting to take care of yourself. Like, it's almost like, uh, it's not self-sabotage, but people sometimes, coworkers and such will sabotage each other. And I don't want to put people in that predicament. So we start with something that they're comfortable with with doing uh, and it's easy to implement within their lifestyle. Yeah. I think all too often people get caught up in, in trying to be like perfect right off the bat. They hear things like, Oh, I need to take 10,000 steps a day. But then they look at their steps and they're at like 400 and they're like, ah, that's never going to happen. So I might as well just not try. So being able to make those small attainable goals and have that person be successful is huge. And you brought something up off topic that I think, 
is super interesting and is quite a shame that it's true is there is this stigma when people go about making lifestyle changes and improvements to their health that other people around them, I don't know if it's out of jealousy or out of, like you said, self-sabotage or kind of like, I don't want to see you succeed because I haven't done this. But it is all too often that when people try to make improvements in their life, that people around them try to make them fail and bring them down and talk negatively about that. And one, if you're that person, stop doing it because it's inappropriate. (laughs) Two, if you have those people in your life, you really need to learn how to tune them out because you're like doing things to make your life better and having, you know, that outside voice and trying to bring you down, just knowing that that's like jealousy or they're not there to support you is is a, a good reason to never really listen to them. And then third, it kind of goes to show the importance of surrounding yourself with like-minded people and how much, you know, environment goes into reducing that friction and putting yourself in a place to succeed. So shameless plug, that's something that we're huge about at Resilient is getting that group of like-minded people that are all there to support each other and help each other succeed and give each other that support they need when they are making those lifestyle changes because they're not easy to make and they do have a large impact that's a lot more reaching than you would originally think. So I just side side comment. I don't really have a question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think those me against the world types are a lot less likely to see succeed anecdotally from my experience compared to those that have a very strong support network around them. And I'm glad you brought up the word friction again, Paul and Dustin said it earlier when we first got started that there is friction between us and forming new habits or new behaviors and, you know, I think the easiest example is, you know, you floss your teeth before bed. Great. Just leave the floss on the counter so you see it and you do it. If it's hidden away in the drawer, you don't see it. It doesn't cross your mind. You don't do it. And in reducing friction in the fitness world, it's a little bit easier to reduce the friction to training where, you you know, you have a gym or you have a plan and, you know, you leave your clothes in the car and it's easy to go and do. But it's very difficult to totally uproot a support network or like an anti-support network if the people around you aren't, aren't helping, whether it's a a spouse, a significant other, or, you know, your, your friends who are constantly trying to drag you to the bars or the clubs on the weekend. And so it it can be a really difficult conversation to have with somebody when the people that are surrounding them aren't, aren't pushing them towards their goals. And, you know, that's, it's kind of sad to think about that people are out there doing that, but that was, yeah, you brought up a good point, Dustin. Yeah, I think, I think everybody has faced that challenge at some point, you know, and something to always remember for those people maybe going through that uh, at this point in time is to, you know, to lead by example. I don't think it's, uh, you know, we know those people who are maybe pushy about their lifestyles on other people. I think it's important to just do your thing and still know that you can totally be social and you can, you know, still have fun and live your life. This is something that should enhance your life. And it's not, it's not you necessarily now all of a sudden you're becoming, I'm putting air quotes up, a health nut. I want you to be a nut about everything else, like your sleep, the fact that you do want to build healthy relationships, the fact that you do want to spend more time outside, the fact that you do want to like play and just experience joy in your life. Like this isn't about, you know, like you said, being that one man, you know, man on a mission where you're, you know, you have blinders on because that's no fun uh, for anybody who's done that. It's you want to experience this life with other people and training should be a way to make all those things better. Right. I think that's something we all talk about is, is the reason why we enjoy this so much uh, is because we know what it's done for us and we just want to help other people experience that same, that same thing. Are there ways now that you're working remotely with people that you try to create those relationships or that supportive environment? Cause it is something that's a lot easier to do in person. You know, you, sometimes you don't even have to do the work Two people that live in next to each other yeah. just start chatting and, and they're friends now. It's very, I'm not going to lie. It's very challenging online because you're not there with that person and, and you don't know sometimes that person's exact situation. You know, I think you want to, I think talk openly about these things because I think in fitness, especially I've seen people go down 
kind of a, a sideways path there where they lose sight of why they're doing this in the first place, right? And they become maybe overly, in ter- like in terms of like they're overly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like exuberant about their fitness goals, whereas they forgot that they started this to live a healthier lifestyle and now they they are leaving other people, uh, I won't say behind, but they're forgetting about other people in their lives. So it's, it's very challenging online. I'm currently offering a, like a group training program, shameless plug, but that's a little bit of what I'm trying to achieve there is to create some form of community for people who want it. And that's utilizing, and it's not the same, like it's definitely not the same as being in person and having a group of friends that you train with. There's definitely something to that, but there is power to knowing that someone else that you no, even if it's virtually is kind of going is going through the same thing you are and you can share that experience. So it's possible. I'm not saying it's the best option though. You know, there's nothing can still be being with people in person and you know, having those relationships. Is that group you're talking about like a Facebook group or a Zoom training session? So that that's a Facebook group and that's the the train for life program that I, I just started. And my my hope is to kind of build it into almost like a virtual gym in a way where people can have different programming options that they can select. And then I would use that platform to kind of facilitate lifestyle changes, uh, provide education, teach people the importance of all the different things that we're talking about on this call today. You know, it's kind of the big picture thing I had that I have in mind again, but I, I won't say that it beats in-person relationships. It just doesn't. Yeah, this is uh this is the first week that gyms have been back open and you know Paul and I I know Paul were on opposite schedules and so we haven't seen each other too much but the consensus that I've got from people a lot this week is that you know it's just great to see people's faces even if it's a little bit different even if we're distanced in the gym and have masks on that it it's just different when you're looking at somebody who isn't on the other side of a screen you know I made a joke with Mo today that oh wow you're three dimensional <laughs> you know, just to see him on a, on a laptop screen so <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I've even noticed that too, going back to my gym. And I was kind of, you know, when this whole thing started, I was like, yeah, I love training at home. This is great. I'm on my own schedule. But now being back into the gym and just seeing people, not, I'm not like an overly social person to begin with. I generally go into the gym to train and that's it. But there is something about being out of your typical environment, seeing other human being, uh, beings' faces. And uh, yeah, you say hi to someone. It, it's just... It might be brief in my case, but it definitely, it feels good. Yeah, I think we, uh, you know, it's, it, like you said, it's nice to see people's faces, but we want it to be on our terms. Yeah. You know? We don't want to <laughs> have to stay home. <laughs> we want to go out when we want right. to and have the ability to go back home. That's why we always drive everywhere we go. <laughs> yeah, we wanna, so we can leave whenever. We got, got three introverts on a podcast here. <laughs> <laughs> In our separate rooms <laughs> by ourselves. <Yeah. laughs> we're, we're in the same building right now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think going back again, you know, we talked about training three times a week. We talked about increasing NEAT. Is there stuff that, you know, you view as fluff that that extra, the client that has extra time gets to do? may or may not be doing much for them, but they like it. And, you know, it's probably not doing them any harm. What, what kind of stuff falls into that category for you, Dustin? Oh, man, if, if people want to do things like extra ab work, and I'm just going to call it that, like if people want to do extra arm work, which I still, I love, like I'm not going to hate on it. You know, if it, whatever the person kind of wants to do, and I don't necessarily view it as fluff, because if that's the thing that keeps that person engaged and coming back, that's a win for me. So if I throw whatever at you in in a dose that's reasonable, that's not necessarily going to interfere with whatever else that we're doing, but you enjoy it and it keeps you coming back. That's a home run for me. So I I think as a coach, I I try to do my job is to like eliminate the fluff. So if if I just think something is absolutely ridiculous, like we're not even going to bring it up, but I'm, I really can't even off the top of my head, think of anything like that. You know, it's, I think also at this point in time, a lot of the people who come to me at are already reading my content, whether they subscribe to my newsletter or, you know, my Instagram page. So they kind of know what they're getting to, to an extent, but everybody still has like their things that they want to do. Like I have a client who just wants to do calves multiple times a week. So we do calves and 
is it's not hurting anything. In many ways, I think actually cap work is beneficial. But you know, a couple sets at the end of a training session, he feels like he's building huge calves and loves it. So we're gonna keep doing calf work. Don't let him know that calves are impossible to grow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not you, you, can you either got them or you don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> gain weight. That's probably the best advice. Yeah, man. Yeah, gain weight. Walk around, take yeah. 20,000 steps a yeah. day for a year and then lose it. 400 pound guy taking 20,000 steps is a lot of calf raises. <laughs> oh, I've, I've seen IFBB pro looking calves on, you know, overweight individuals because yeah. they've been carrying around that weight for so long. You're like, like that's crazy, but <laughs> definitely need that high frequency for the calves. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's how you convince some uh, some of your clients to take their steps. So, yeah, you want bigger calves? You gotta just step, man. <laughs> Go for walks uphill. <laughs> All right. So over the last is is it nine months? How old's your son? He is yeah eight months and some change. Yeah, has your training looked any different from uh, you know a year ago until today? You know, I think my training has slowly been evolving over the last several years anyway, just as business has picked up and has, you know, as my priorities have shifted slightly, you know, training is still very important to me. It's something I still love to do. But, you know, now with a son, you know, you're on his schedule. And for the several months or, you know, for the six months that I was working from home and, you know, I was still watching him because my wife, she did stay home for the first three months, but she was able to go back to work. The plan was to, you know, put him into daycare and I would resume my normal schedule. But with him, and I kind of backtrack a little bit, but with him, you know, I have the option of training either first thing in the morning or that's it. So if I don't train first thing in the morning, if that doesn't get done, then I do not train that day. So it just becomes, you know, we're talking about, you know, efficiency of time, but I've eliminated choices. So I only have a limited time window to train. I only have uh, a specific time of the day that I can train. So it really just reinforced the idea that my habits need to be pretty rock solid because I don't want to get in the, uh, in the routine of missing training sessions. Um, I don't want to also, you know, I don't want to get in the habit of maybe biting off more than I could chew in terms of volume or intensity because I need to, I could need to wake up at 3 a.m. or something to a, to a crying baby, which doesn't happen often. I'm just saying like that could be a reality. So it's just managing my training program so that I have energy to do other things in my life. I'm able to, you know, complete each training session knowing that I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish that day. And I'm not wondering if I needed to do anything else. What are some of these, these adjustments you're making, right? Cause I think you said a few times you, you adjust your training session, but to some, somebody who might be listening, who is a, a new father, a new parent and might be unsure of where to go is that, shorter, more frequent sessions? Is Are there exercises you're prioritizing? Are there anything else that I guess you could be specific on there? Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, exercise selection is important. So I'm, I'm doing exercises that feel good for me uh, and make sense for my goals, which aren't any different than the exercises that both of you guys do. And it's just knowing that, okay, when I go into a session, I have a, I have a game plan. I'm going to execute this game plan to the best of my ability uh, so that when I, you know, as soon as I walk into the gym, like I talked about warmups earlier, like I'm not necessarily spending 10 or 15 minutes warming up. I'm starting with an empty bar and I might incorporate maybe different drills in between warmup sets. You know, I, I might do something like a, like a jump or a medicine ball throw, but we're talking minimal effective dose. I'm just trying to wake up a little bit, literally, because it's, you know, 6.15 in the morning when I'm getting started and I tend to work fairly efficiently. I'm not necessarily resting too long in between sets. And it's not that I'm, this is something that I think we, we see quite a bit. It's like, yes, we know that more rest is probably optimal for training results in terms of, you know, maximal strength or hypertrophy, but I'm not necessarily concerned with optimal at this point as much as I am practical. So if if I were following a particular training program that had very long rest, I probably wouldn't even do it because I just can't adhere to it. I want to be able to follow through I want to be done, you know, within an hour tops compared to if we're looking at maybe six, seven, eight years ago, training sessions would typically run 90 minutes, two hours plus, because not only am I doing the 15 minute warm up, but 
the session itself is long and drawn out. I'm maybe doing conditioning on top of that within the same training session. We've all have made those mistakes. And I, so I've cut down not only on the actual time allotted for the training session, but probably training days per week to, to three days a week of strength training and usually three days a week of some sort of aerobic conditioning. Yeah. So it sounds like the most important thing there is, you know, having a plan and knowing exactly what you're going to do when you get to the gym. So you don't waste any time and at trying to execute that plan to the best of your abilities. I think you've mentioned that a couple of times. And I think it's important to highlight is it's not going to be perfect all the time and you have to be okay with that. It's you get there and you do what you can and that's your win for the day. You you did more than nothing. The other option would have been skipping it and being like, oh, it can't be perfect today, so I'm just going to skip it. So getting in there and doing what you can is super important. And just, a, I guess, well, I'll throw in this question real quick. <laughs> uh, yeah. Since we never actually make it under an hour. <laughs> is With that being said, is how do you kind of help people modify and go with the flow while still sticking to the plan when things when when life happens when when you do have to be up at 3 a.m. with a crying baby and get 2 hours of sleep what are you doing that next day to kind of ensure you stay on track yeah i think it starts with managing expectations and you know i i never go into any training session thinking it's going to be a 10 like i just i just don't and that's not to say that i'm doom and gloom but i'm mainly looking to just go in punch the clock and do the appropriate work that day and kind of let those pieces fall where they may. If, you know, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm very fortunate. My son sleeps through the night, most nights, you know, but those first two months or so with a newborn, you know, you are waking up at every three hour, you know, in three hour intervals, and you are going to be dealing with less sleep than you ever have in your entire life. Uh, and I think it's just knowing what to expect and managing in terms of like just total lifestyle stress a- accordingly. So it's probably not the best time to take on the small off squat cycle with high intensity intervals on off days, right? It's understanding that you may need to take a few steps back, but you're better off taking a few steps back and not going through the motions. Like you're still working with intention. You're still trying to drive progress forward, but just know it's going to be on a different time scale. And if you could just put that in your head, And just know like there's light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to get out of this. And when you do, you're going to be thankful that you actually still continue to train. You still continue to do what you can despite the less than optimal circumstances. And, you know, that is something I think I'm talking about with almost everybody, you know, in in terms of, you know, having a bad workout or a bad training session. Like I don't I don't have bad training sessions because I just just kind of let those things roll off my shoulder, you know, And, and I think it's important to understand you talk about going with the flow. It's like, there's going to be highs, there's going to be lows. Let's just try to stay like as even keel as we can. And, you know, if you're applying the correct principles in your programming and you're showing up on, on each training day, just having, you know, lived a lifestyle that's appropriate to making progress, like good things are going to happen. And you might just have to make subtle adjustments to fit whatever is currently going on in your life. And I think that's really important. Yeah, man. Any any training day is a good training day, right? There's no such thing as a bad training day. If you get to the gym and, yeah. and you do something, that's a good training day. <laughs> Ab- absolutely. We frequently will say, you know, it's it's okay to have good days or bad days or, you know, your ups and downs, but you just can't give up. You just got to keep going, push through and, and at least do the, do the minimum for that day. Yeah. Or, you know, on top of that too, I don't think people realize how much harm they're doing to themselves by, getting upset when those things happen. And it's not to say like, if you're really passionate about something, you know, especially if something, somebody is maybe more on the competitive side, like I could see how it's hard to just let a bad training session roll off your shoulders. But if we kind of look at the big picture, it's like, it's one day, it's a drop in the ocean. So, you know, hop back on your horse and get back at it the next day and just manage those expectations uh, the best that you can. I think that's a really motivational spot for us to to wrap this up <laughs> thanks so dustin is uh the king of content i think he's got an article and an instagram post out before 7 a.m every day of the week it's so where can people find your content dustin you can find me at underscore my training plan on instagram my training plan without the underscore was already taken by somebody with like i don't think any post but whatever uh, so <laughs> underscore my training plan on instagram 
uh, is the best place to find me. There's links to my newsletter, which I do try to write in daily. And I try to post, yeah, content almost every single day. Try to be somewhat amusing on my stories and provide value in, in some form or fashion. And, you know, all the things that we talked about today are probably the topics that I'm constantly regurgitating on a daily <laughs> basis. But it's important. They're the one. Yeah, they need to be hammered home for sure. Hey, Amen. Appreciate you taking time out of your afternoon to chit chat with us. Yeah, thanks for so coming. Thank on. you. Yeah. Thanks for being accommodating with my schedule. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no problem. Man. So thanks for listening, everybody. As always, if you guys liked our episode, please be sure to leave us a review on iTunes. They really help us out and push us up in the the ratings. Yeah, we only have like five or four written reviews, which is pathetic because we got like 2,000 listens. So that, that ratio is way off. So step your game up, people. over 100 clients, so come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> 5% of you. Our own clients can't even write us a review. <laughs> everybody's going, everybody's getting more. Whatever they were doing during quarantine, that's going back in their program if we don't get reviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One and a half Bulgarian split squats for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so please, we don't want to beg, but we like reviews. Um, and if you want more information about us and Resilient Training Lab, our website's www.resilienttraininglab.com and our handle is Resilient Training Lab on Instagram. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>